I haven't been in a fishbowl conference room in a long time. Oh, I know. And it's like, this is the uber fishbowl one where everybody can look directly inside. Good thing that nobody's here. Really. <laughs> That's what I'm sitting here like so, pulling down the back of my shirt to make sure I'm not like. <laughs> ah, you're fine. Put my plumber's crack in front of somebody. I do it all the time. I can, <laughs> I can handle it. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or thebourbonconcierge.com and you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia and North Carolina. Drink responsibly and be 21. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. From their bar to yours, Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 a cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky. And you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Welcome back to the episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Just Kenny here today, flying solo, and uh, you know we're back again with the Bourbon Pursuit podcast, and we're going to start coining a, a new phrase because I, I got to thank Blake Ryber, who uh, runs Bourboner.com. He he sent me a message. He was like, "You guys should have a new tagline called the official podcast of Bourbon," and I think that's what we're going to go with. So now we're going to start being your official podcast of Bourbon because nobody else has coined it, and we're going to go ahead and take it since we have the most listeners, the most podcasts, and the best fan base around. So uh, thank you to everybody that does support the show. We definitely appreciate it. And always make sure to write an, uh, you know, a review on iTunes. It always helps go a long way if you, if you haven't done so already. So today we're going to kick it off uh, talking about one of the, the most famous brands uh, that are around the globe, right? It's, it's hard to not see it when you go to a liquor store. You know, to kind of give you a little bit of background and refresher, back on episode 44, we had Fred No, who was the master distiller, Jim Beam, and we had him come on and, you know, it, it's Fred, right? We don't want to, we want to talk about Fred about his life and the, the legacy and the stories that were behind it. Um, and we didn't really touch a lot on the brands. You know, we maybe talked about Booker's Rye a little bit and maybe hinted at some things in the future, but not like the staples, the staples that actually, you know, make this company chug along. They always say that, you know, you can have a lot of limited releases, but 
there's always the, something has to pull the train at the end of the day. And they have a bunch of staple brands that we want to talk and dive into. So today for the show, we have Beth Burroughs. Beth is the Kentucky, I can't even talk today, the Kentucky Bourbon Ambassador for Beam Suntory. So Beth, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So before we kind of dive into all this, we always have to get an understanding of who you are, your background, and how you fell into this role and, you know, how you started with bourbon, all that good stuff. Pure luck, um, if you will. <laughs> I've been in the bar industry, I guess, since I was about seven years old. So my parents okay, owned and that's, operated. I was going to say, let's rewind a second. <laughs> all the way back. Um, <laughs> so my parents owned and operated a bar in Western New York, and it was called Guitars and Cadillacs. I was responsible for busing tables and sorting bottles to go back for recycle distribution. Um, so... I knew all of the distributors and what they carried at a very young age. You know. Child labor at its finest, right? Things that your parents are super proud of when you mention <laughs> it out loud, right? Um, but so I, I kind of got that idea for what it was like to to run a business and, and see what my parents were doing and, and really get an appreciation just for the family that that type of atmosphere creates. Um, so from there, ended up you know going through my schooling, moved from New York to Kentucky, Ended up in Louisville to go to college for sports admin um, and working in bars like many people do. As, uh, as a sports as, admin, yeah. As a, yeah. You gotta do what you gotta do, right? Getting through college. So um, I worked at a couple of various places and then got out of it for a year and did uh, business liability insurance, which was interesting in and of itself. Learned a whole lot there, but then had that feel for it, had to go back. I really needed a, a taste for the bar life again. So ended up at Down One Bourbon Bar, started there as a server in 2013 when they opened their doors, and then worked my way throughout the next three and a half years or so, um, becoming a bartender, mixologist, lead bartender, AGM, and then eventually the GM. You did a lot in just a few few short time there then. It, it was a crazy whirlwind, but it was an amazing experience. Um, you know, I fell in love with bourbon from day one, which was something that I had kind of touched on a little bit before then, but had never really delved into. So learning everything about how to taste it and then the intricacies and, and the history behind it and the science behind it. I was not much on history and science until I found out exactly what it did for bourbon. And, you know, if they just would have told me a little bit sooner, I think I would have done a lot better in school um, in those subjects. But it was just... It took off. So I'm going to go on a limb and say that your first experience with bourbon, actually, you know, tasting it wasn't back in New York, but hopefully here, maybe in Kentucky. So kind of give me an idea of, you know, whether it was, you know, not out with friends drinking bourbon. Uh, we, you know, we always have the pregame time. So was it pre gaming or did you really start getting into it a little bit more when you're doing your bartending? Uh, it was all bartending. Um, basically, just being able to take that base spirit and play with it and do everything that I could to enhance it in cocktails. So I was much much more about the base spirit being prevalent every single time versus covering it up. And with bourbon, I think that that's incredibly important because it does have such amazing characteristics that come through in classic cocktails, new wave cocktails and everything. So that was really where the love kind of developed was being able to taste through and having the plethora of bourbons that I had on my back bar. Uh, we were at over 175 when I left. So, I mean, it was a a plethora of things to play with. So coming from a, a bartending background, when you see, uh, you know, you said 175 different bourbons, like what's the, what's the, the idea of having so many bourbons to make cocktails? Because when I think about it, like you kind of lose a little bit of the flavoring, you know, of, of course you're gonna lose the pure flavoring when you start mixing it with things. But what's the idea of having multiple different kinds of bourbon for different types of cocktails or anything like that? Well, your mash bill is incredibly important, how that's going to carry through your proof is incredibly important, whether you're using a rye versus a bourbon, um, how old that bourbon is. Sometimes the, the notes and the characteristics that are coming through when you're tasting are really important in what you're doing when you're creating those cocktails. So I, I think it's just, it was great to have them all to play with. I mean, it was a kid in a candy store, if you will, where you got to, to kind of experiment. And that's where I really got to learn exactly what worked well. You know, I would take these different brands and uh, there were a few favorites that I always had from the Bean Portfolio and really learned how to amplify them and make them more than just the bourbon that they were, which they were fantastic on their own, but then I kind of, kind of got to give them a new life, if you will. So kind of talk, let's talk, I'm, I know we're harping on the the, the bartending thing, but only because no, I, I love it because I think cocktails are, it's, it's a, a huge surge that we're seeing in regards to bourbon. But when I think about when I want to make uh, something standard, uh, old fashioned Manhattan, whatever it is, 
what's like the the proof level that I'm looking for when I'm doing these or a certain age statement or is it just kind of like throw something at the wind and see what sticks, right? It totally depends on the person and their palate. It really does. What it is that you like to have come through. So if you are an avid old-fashioned drinker, you're probably going to take a base spirit that's somewhere from 100 proof and above. Um, if you're just trying to get into it and really learning what an old-fashioned is, an 80 to an 86 proof might be where you're looking at. So you can cultivate that palate for the old-fashioned. It's just, it really depends on you. Okay. That's what, so I don't see a whole lot of people like saying like, oh, we need like barrel proof kind of, uh, you know, kind of bourbons for cocktails, right? I don't really see a whole lot of that yet. Um, sometimes you will. I mean, depending on what that cocktail is, if it's going to be incredibly spirit forward, uh, if it it needs to have that to counteract whatever you're putting into it, you know, maybe you're putting another high proof spirit in there that has very strong characteristics, um, just throw out like a Benedictine or something like that. You would need something to help counteract that. Um, just... It really all just depends on palate. Really I got does. you. So, I, I mean, I've been experimenting a lot. You know, when I go out to a restaurant, you know, I typically always order a Manhattan up. That's just kind of my way of being able to do it. But I typically ask for like a, a rye. I don't know why. For the first time I had it with a rye, I was like, this actually tastes pretty good. Now, I haven't gone as far in saying like, I want a Booker's rye, something that's like 13 years and 100 and something proof. But uh, who knows? Don't mix Booker's rye. Just <laughs> sip it neat, savor it, and thank your lucky stars you have in your glass. There you go. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so let's, okay, let's go ahead and let's kind of forge on a little bit and talk about the history of, of, you know, you know, Jim Beam a little bit in itself. So kind of talk about, you know, your role as a, a Beam Centauri ambassador and, and what that entails to, and, you know, when you go and preach the gospel of Jim Beam. It really is just about pe- preaching the gospel of, of Jim Beam bourbons. And it's, um, traveling the entire state. I, I very rarely go outside of the state for these type of things, but traveling the whole state to talk about what Jim Beam Bourbon is, who we are, uh, throwing events and parties in their honor, and really just showcasing exactly what we are as a brand. So uh, like we talked about a little bit before, a lot of people have preconceived notions about brands, whether they be ours or other people's, and we're just constantly trying to to show who we are and be happy, you know? <laughs> so let's talk about Jim Beam itself for a minute, right? Okay. It's a, if I'm not mistaken, it's an eighth generation family kind of um, label bourbon. So kind of a little bit, talk about a little bit the history of Jim Beam too. So as of right now, we are at our seventh generation master distiller with Fred No. Oh, um, off by one. It's okay. okay. We've got Freddie. Freddie's Freddie, in, yeah, we're he's, lining up, right? He's almost there. Um, he's actually working his way through the distillery right now. Uh, last I knew he was fermentation manager. So he is working his way every step through to make sure that he understands from the ground up exactly what it entails to be a master distiller. Um, and like I said, Fred is our seventh generation master distiller who's known for carrying on everything that Booker did, plus a lot of our more recent innovations like Double Oak, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, And then before, wait, if you want to go all the way back, it was Jacob Beam that started and sold his first barrel of whiskey in 1795. So uh, he was a farmer, moved his family to Kentucky and decided that with all that extra excess grain, that's what he needed to do. So, and this was also, I mean, it, they were one, they had a medicinal license for prohibition, if I'm not mistaken. They did not. Oh, okay. No. So, so kind of talk about a little bit how that that so, hurdle was overcome. <laughs> Jim Beam, who was our fourth generation master distiller, actually bought our distillery that we're in now in Claremont in 1922. So two years into prohibition, he really did think that this was a fad. It wasn't going to come through it, for a very long period of time. Um, he was sadly mistaken. Um, so during that time, he actually was a citrus farmer and he was running a rock quarry for a limestone rock. So he was always the businessman and always the entrepreneur and always on to the next thing. Never worked for another man during prohibition. Citrus farming in Kentucky doesn't sound like it was a it smart It was in idea. Florida. <laughs> oh, okay. So, okay. yeah, it was, I was like, uh, wait a minute. He was trying his hand in, in another place and, and just really seeing what it was that you could do. Because at that point in time, you know, you're spreading out um, where the bourbon is going. You was going to the bigger city. So you're looking at New York City. People were going down to Florida. They were just trying to spread that word. So he was down there, saw that that could go on and I guess tried his hand at that as well. So it wasn't until, you know, what, I guess 11 years later that from when he bought the distillery to when Prohibition finally ended, that he was able to get it up and running in 120 days. He was over 80 years old, 70 years old, I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. 
talking about the retirement plan. You're actually working in retirement mm-hmm. after that. <laughs> oh yeah, he was he was a hard worker. Uh, there's not a single person that would say that that Jim Beam was not the hardest worker that we had. You right. know, during that time, he was always doing what he could to further the brand and further the family. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the. I guess you could say the the variations, um, varieties of Jim Beam itself. So you have the standard white label. Kind of talk about what goes in the white label, um, you know, basically why that's the staple of the brand itself. As we said, there's always there's always something that's got to pull the train, and I think this is the thing that pulls the train. Oh, white label is definitely what pulls the train. It's the highest uh, selling bourbon in the entire world. So... It's there as our staple. It's what Jim Beam was creating. It's got its own yeast strain, its own mash bill. Um, and it's just that staple 80 proof four year old Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey that we we do a lot to craft around. So we only have our two mash bills and a rye mash bill that we craft everything with, which is pretty crazy to think about. I mean, aside from our, our one offs, our experimentals and things like that from our base portfolio, we're dealing with two bourbon and a rye. So and we'll talk about all of them yeah, here in a few, but yeah, there's a lot. So yeah, we're talking about taking that and, and manipulating distillation, manipulating uh, barrel proof entry, dealing with how we're aging them, where we're aging them. We do do not rotate our barrels. So as soon as they go and, and go to rest, they rest there until they're ready to go. Um, so th- it's really just all about the fact that that white label is where we started and where we're jumping off from and all of the things that we could really do with that liquid as it aged or as we did different barrels. And like I said, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But So when I start thinking about how widely distributed Jim Beam white label is, how many barrels does Jim Beam have put down right now that are aging? Do you have, you have any idea? <sighs> they recently the did it, here. and I wish I had the number on me. I don't have it on me, and I don't want to misspeak because uh, Jason Capel will murder me if I say the wrong number. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't want to misspeak. Okay. But it is, there's a lot, a okay. lot, Landa. We right now have more barrels of bourbon in Kentucky than we do people, and Jim Beam has the highest number of barrels of any company inside of that. We'll expect to see a pie chart here at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. We can t- <laughs> totally write that out. I'm just messing with you. So let's let's move into uh, some more of the the, the staples of of the Jim Beam label. You know, there's there's things as you know, you have the you have the white label, black label, double oak, devil's cut, rye bonded, single barrel. There's so many types. So kind of give us a little bit about what's unique about each one. So when people go to the store and they see, you know eight different versions of Jim Beam in front of them. Like, how do they decide what to go for? What, what, what's going to really be the way that they should either progress through them or um, should they just collect the whole set? Well, I think they should collect everything <laughs> and taste through them as often and as frequently as, as they want to. Um, but that might be a little bit biased. So each one of them has their own characteristics and their own life and you start on the white label. Always start there. 80 proof white label. See what our base is. And then if you take that white label and you let it stay in the barrel for a little bit longer and age, that's when you're going to get our black label. So, And it's also jumping up in proof from 80 to 86 proof. Now, if you take that four-year liquid and you pull it out of the barrel and put it into a new charred oak barrel and let it rest for a little longer, that's when you're going to get our Jim Beam double oaked. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Now, one thing that I, that was always noticed is that the the black label used to say eight years, but now it's not. Now it's it's not aged eight years. I think it's somewhere in like six years, maybe somewhere around, around there. there. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, we didn't know eight years ago that people were going to love Jim Beam Black as much as they did. So we didn't lay down enough, which is, I think, a common problem that everybody has in the bourbon industry since the bourbon boom. People want a lot more than we have in stock. So we've amped up production of that Jim Beam Black, but we've also had to drop the age statement just because that youngest barrel that goes in there is the age statement that you have to go with on the bottle. So if we have to pull, and then all of them were eight years and we had to pull one six year and then it would automatically become a six year barrel. So by doing that, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. We had to drop off the age statement just to make sure that we could keep it going. But we did just win at the International Wine and Spirits Competition in London as the highest rated bourbon in the world in blind taste testing. So that shows that even though we dropped the age statement, it's still that premium of a bourbon that Absolutely. in a blind taste testing, it still won out. So I guess, um, and I'm going to harp on an age statement just no, real quick good. before we kind of dive back into what we were supposed to be talking about. But do you kind of foresee a future of putting in an age statement back on it because you know there's a there's a whole different camp out there that says like you know we, we'd love to see the age statement to know exactly like what we're buying and all these other different things because there's always this uh, we're going to just 
t- you know, proof it to taste or we're going to age it to taste sort of profile. Uh, but there's another camp that they want to say like, oh, we want to be able to compare things side by side to kind of see what's what's really different between these two either brands or ages or whatever it is. And I mean, I could understand that for just like the continuity of wanting to know exactly what it is that's in that bottle in front of you. And I mean, we try to be as transparent as possible aside from some of our, our things that are more proprietary. Uh, but I can't speak to whether or not we'll ever put the age statement back on there. I know that age statements have dropped off kind of across the map um, and a lot of different brands just because the same thing we were talking about, just that that liquid supply is not there for the demand. Um, But we employ, and I know other people do as well, these amazing sensory scientists and research and development scientists that create the exact same thing every single time to the decimal. So, I mean, there is a science that goes in behind it, and I know that that kind of sometimes takes away from some people in the the lure of bourbon, but it's very important because we have to have that as well. So to say that the age is going to go back on, I don't know. Um, We'd have to figure out if there's going to be a plateau at some point. That's of, a Fred question, yeah. uh, a lot more than it's a me question. So... Age statements are great, but I don't think that they're absolutely necessary at this moment in time. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll kind of jump jump across now. So talk about uh, so you talk about doubled oak um, about how it you know basically just rebarrels itself, right? So you essentially you dump it and then you rebarrel it. That's mm-hmm. that's kind of the process, right? Now when you do it, uh, you know because at this at this time we have uh, so four years you have a little bit of evaporation somewhere around 20 percent somewhere around there some maybe a little bit more and and when you're rebarreling it is it back to the brim is that what you're doing yeah we're filling all the way back to the top so that's going to be new contact with all of the the char on the inside so we do a level four alligator char which is a very high char so you're going to get a lot of those caramelized sugars that are going to rise to the front so when you when you taste through double oak you're going to notice the difference in how much of that vanilla and caramel comes through and even that extra char layer that comes through in that bourbon versus the gym bean black which is a little bit more mellowed out strictly because it's been sitting in that same barrel mellowing for a while um so when Makers 46 does theirs, you know, they, it's essentially a rebarreling, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's like 45 days they, they rebarrel it or something like that. So is there a, maybe without giving anything proprietary away, can you say how long it's re-aged in, in double oak? It's going to be about half a year, a little bit less than that. Okay. Depending. I mean, it is still to taste. Um some places and some of our rickhouses are going to change it and manipulate it just a little bit different than some of the other ones. So we're always going to go to taste, but it's generally three to six months. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So the next one I want to touch on is devil's cut, because when I think about this, you know, you, you kind of see they, there was a commercial, I think about that. I don't know if it had, you know, um, where it twists the stage. Yeah. I was about to say you yes. sitting there like infamous yeah, twisting of the stage <laughs> and trying to just squeeze every last drop or you, uh, you know, refilling it with water and shaking it around like Robitussin and pouring them out. And then you're like, Oh, got more Tussin. Right. So uh, like, how are you, how are you getting devil's cut? Like where's, where's the idea for that come from? So devil's cut comes from the idea of sweating the barrels, which happened way back when, when you would have the extra barrels, what was trapped inside of the wood stayed trapped inside of the wood. So what they would do is add water to those barrels and they would set them out and allow for that water to pull all the extra bourbon that was trapped inside of the wood back out. So we're doing the same process. We're pulling that extra liquid that's stuck in there back out. And then we're going to cut the bourbon instead of cutting it with just our normal limestone filtrated water, we're going to cut it with the limestone filtrated water that's been taken out of the barrels. Gotcha. So it's going to take all of that that sweat, if you will, and then cut it back through. So you're going to get a lot more of those oaky notes that come through on Devil's Cut than anything else. And these are all classified as Kentucky straight bourbon whiskeys at this Correct. point too, right? So there's nothing added. There's nothing nope. crazy that's going on. It's just a little bit of a different technique of being able to um, age it differently or whatever it is. Yeah, right? and just create a new expression for a different palate. So you said that um, you also have a bonded bourbon, right? I mean, we, we, we had last month we had Bernie Lovers come on and talk about, um, you know, just bottled and bond in general and like what makes it so great. So kind of talk about a little bit different in there other than just, you know, we say we proof it at a hundred, right? So. Right. And, uh, you know, there used to be the, the major standards that everything went by and the, the governmental man that had to be in there at the same time as the master distiller to make sure that all of the warehouses were up to code and completely standard and we weren't doing anything to our bourbon. So this is a, a throwback exactly like everyone else that's doing their bonded whiskey. Um, so it's going to be the hundred proof oak forward, delicious, amazing blending bourbon that we have in our portfolio. 
And then single barrel. That's the last one I want to touch on because, um, you know, I, honestly, I, I don't think I've, I've ever even tried the single barrel. Did you mean single barrel? Yeah, I don't think I've ever even tried it. So. It's delicious. You should. <laughs> I'll put that on the wish list. Christmas list. Right? Yeah. Uh, so normally when we have our 80 proof single barrel, I'm sorry, when we have our 80 proof white label, we're taking a cross hashing of our Rick House. So we're going to take some from the top, some from the middle, which we call the sweet spot, and then some from the bottom layer, uh, levels of our Rick House. And the reason that we're doing that is to get the consistency of flavor. So we've realized that barrels can go and get filled in the exact same day, be put in the same Rick Houses, and live side by side for the exact same number of, of years and then when you pull them out, they taste completely different, which is why our Knob Creek single barrel program is so amazingly great is because you are able to do stuff like that and every single barrel is so different. So that's what the difference is, is we're taking our white label, which is our four year, and we're pulling it out, but it's going to be one single barrel going into the bottling versus that cross hatching of a Rick house. And what's that proof debt? So that should be at 90 proof. Okay. So it's a little bit, uh oh, uh oh, PR yeah, person. I'm pretty sure that's at 90 proof. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have any bottles sitting around? We can, can we look through the glass here? We'll keep behind you. <laughs> so w- with that, um, I mean, are you going to see a pretty similar, uh, I guess you could say, flavor profile when you're, when you're picking up a single barrel, whether I pick it up here in Kentucky versus Wisconsin or wherever? Um, or are you going to have some tiny, subtle differences that might be just because it is the nature of being a single barrel? You're going to see the differences. So some of them might be a little bit more enhanced. You know, there are a lot of oak, vanilla, and caramel that comes through, especially at a four-year. Uh, we don't have so many of those grain notes, which usually come through as like a banana flavor. We don't tend to have as much of that. Um, so you'll notice just those subtle intricacies that maybe elevate a little bit more oak or a little bit more vanilla, a little bit more caramel. Usually it's going to be oak and caramel, though, because vanilla tends to be something that comes in around the five- to six-year mark. So we have uh, you have one item in your all's cat- or catalog that is very widely known in regards of having a single barrel program, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So why not go with a single barrel program for the, the Jim Beam aspect only because it's, it is a single barrel, right? We and do I can, have a single barrel program oh, for see? the Jim Beam white label. It just doesn't do as much as the Knob Creek, just because I think the Knob Creek is a much more well-known program. Yeah. Um, at Down One, I actually purchased the first barrel of uh, Jim Beam single barrel when I was there. So it, it, it exists. It really is there. It's just not something that how you you don't come to the distillery to do that. That's more of a kit that you pick through. Gotcha. Okay, so it's kind of like you need to really ask for it if that's something that you really want to do. Right. Then, right. Which it's a fantastic bourbon, and I think more people should. Right on. If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon, and that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus Magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. So I think we've uh, we've almost touched on all of them, but there's also some one-offs that, that come with the Jim Beam. You know, you've got um, some, you know, the Masters, the Masters Collection. You've got some other ones that are the... I don't know. Maybe they're, they're just one-offs, right? So kind of talk a little bit about these, whether they're science experiments, whether they're limited editions or whether they're whatever, right? 
With Jim Beam, I think the the most recent one that you can pinpoint on would be the Harvest Collection that we did, which were 11-year-old liquids. There were six releases. They all came in 375s. Um, they were a high rye, a triticale. Excuse me if I'm saying that wrong. That's how I've always called it. You can, you can, I'm sure. Why don't you I, explain what that it. is first? It's a grain. Okay. So triticale is a type of grain. Um, and then we had our rolled oat. We had... I have to go through all of them in my Let me head. Say, let's say quinoa and... Yeah, we didn't have a quinoa one. <laughs> we weren't thinking about that 11 years ago. Um, and then there was a brown rice as well. The brown rice was one of my absolute favorites. And every time I can find it on a shelf, I definitely That's try right. to I kind of remember. Off. I remember seeing that now. So those were something that Booker was doing when he was just kind of experimenting and playing around and seeing exactly what he wanted to do moving forward. Um, Booker was known for that. He was a tinkerer, especially when it came to bourbon recipes and innovations uh, with ham smoking and, and all of those things. Um, so it, it really was just something that they tried and it went off, I think, really well. And we got some really amazing liquid out of it. And then we got great feedback from the market on that. And now we can kind of move forward and, and see if there's other things. The rumor has it that a brown rice got laid down about the time that I got hired. So okay. Don't quote me on it, but fingers crossed. I'm hoping for it. So, so. we'll see in seven years or three <laughs> However years. However long or, they decide yeah. to do it, yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's cool. So then also talk about the uh, distiller's masterpiece, right? Because that's something that a lot of people, whether they're 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 new to this or whether the, you're a seasoned veteran in it, you'll go and you'll see, I think it's usually like a 180 or $200 bottle. Mm -hmm. And I get people that send me pictures all the time. Like, should I get this? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I've never had it. Like, I don't know much about it. So kind of, kind of give us your, your take on it. So it's a beautiful bottle. First and foremost, it's breathtaking to have on your back bar. And then once you pull it out of that amazing packaging and, and pour it in your glass, you're going to get the beautiful sherry notes from the Pedro Jimenez sherry casks. So Pedro Jimenez is a, a pretty sweet sherry as well, which gives this robust sherry with an amazing bourbon backbone. So that's what you're sipping inside of that. Okay. Gotcha. See, that's all, something I didn't even know about, right? So I guess what makes that a, a 180 or $200 bottle? Is it because of how expensive it was to get the casks or is it hyper age, super age the long time or like what, what makes it so, so it's unique. the crafting that goes behind it just because it, it does take a lot to create this, this beautiful different product that we have in our entire line. Um, and because it doesn't come out nearly as much as the rest of the stuff. So right. I'm just not necessarily a limited edition or a limited allocation and that type of respect, but it is something that's not the the thing you're going to find at every single store. Right. No, absolutely. So we've, we've, I think, uh, have we touched on everything regards to Jim Beam before we move on to the other pieces in the I mean, for the, the most part, we do have the Jim Beam rye as well, but we can talk about a, a bit of the difference there between that and the Knob Creek rye. So I guess, I guess if you, you know, you're, you're, you, you travel around, you drink a lot of Jim Beam. Right, so I've responsibly, got, yes, responsibly, and so I we've we talked about six or seven of them here. So if you have to have, you know, if if you're if you're on a budget here and you got to choose one bottle out of this, which one which one do you go for? I know uh, the it's, Jim Beam portfolio. I mean, that's really it's choosing, difficult. It's choosing it your is. favorite child. But it really I'm is. Put you on the spot. Uh, if I was going to say anything, I think it would have to be the Jim Beam Black as of right now. Um, when it comes to the Jim Beam base premium portfolio. And that's just because it's great to sip neat. It's great to mix in cocktails. It, it, the versatility of it is just kind of unrivaled, I find. So I, it's a go-to for me. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So now that we got that out of you, so let's move on a little <laughs> bit. So I want to talk about, because there is there is more than just Jim Beam with inside the Beam Suntory uh, portfolio. And anybody that's been around this kind of knows, but there's other brands such as Knob Creek, Baker's, Basil Hayden, Old Granddad, Booker's, Old Crow. I might have hit on all of them, but let's, let's talk about each one of those individually. You know, we talked about the history of Jim Beam and its seventh generation. Now, I want to talk about Knob Creek. Like, before we even get into what makes it different, like, I want to know the story behind it. Like, why, why is it called Knob Creek? I'm assuming there's a creek called Knob Creek. There is Creek, a Knob Creek, yes. Right? But I, I kind of want to know, like, what was the uh, inspiration behind it or anything like that? So Knob Creek was part of the Small Batch Collection, or is part of the Small Batch Collection, that Booker created in the early 90s is when it released out into the public. He'd been working on it throughout the 80s as well. But this was just an expression for him that came in a small batch and then a single barrel where it was that 100 proof to 120 proof liquid that was meant to be a throwback to the pre-prohibitionary liquid. So what he was trying to do was create that delicious, full-flavored, great-aged, higher-proof 
bourbon and it came out as Knob Creek. So um, Knob Creek is an actual place. It is not on the distillery property, but it is a place that um, ran near Lincoln's childhood home. Okay. So that's where the whole Knob Creek thing ties in. Um, and then if you look at, we have a bottle right here. And if you look at it, you can actually see the new packaging has uh, the newspaper article running across oh, it. Oh, shit, about I didn't even Creek. realize it. So, yeah. so anybody that goes out there and they, they look at the new packaging, you know, take the bottle and flip it upside down. And when you flip it upside down, you can actually see the news article that's on the front of it. Actually, actually yeah, that's what I was... It looked like the Matrix at first when you look at it. Right? You got all these like green letters that <laughs> are floating down. Zeros and ones, but no, there's actual <laughs> words on there. Um, and so that's on all of the new packaging. And one of the things we were talking about, our sensory scientists earlier, we do have our Global Innovation Center, which does all sorts of things, you know, down to the packaging. And when we realized our old packaging, I'm sure you remember it, where it was kind of clear and had a number on the front of it. And you couldn't see it as soon as it went on a back bar or as soon as it went on a shelf, it just disappeared. So when we got to where we saw that, we had to really take a step back and figure out what was going to look right. And that's when we we took it back to the roots. The pre-prohibitionary style, which is when they used to wrap it in newspaper anyway. So when you actually watch this get wrapped, it's wrapped like you would a newspaper. Interesting. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all a throwback to that pre-prohibitionary liquid. Real cool, real cool. So one of the other things that, you know, we were talking about disappearing of age statements, you know, Knob Creek's even seen a disappearing of age statement that's happening. Now, one of the things that's that's unique is, is that you can go and you can go to the store and you you, you, you get because it was a nine year old, mm -hmm. right? I think it's about what our it was. single barrel still is okay. Yeah, so small you, batch was the only one that dropped the age statement. Okay, so you see that. So single barrel still nine, but the, the cool thing is, is that this is probably one of the most prominent single barrel programs that's out there when it comes to Knob Creek. And I don't think I've seen a Knob Creek single barrel ever go out from a private program that's less than 12 years. And I've seen them as high as 15 years, right? So it, it, it's always unique to be able to see that you have the ability to, to, to have those rare gems out there, if you can get them, to be able to get something that's a little bit higher in age too. Yeah, but you know, higher in age doesn't always mean the better the bourbon. Oh, it really we're going to go back to this argument. We huh? can go back to this <laughs> argument. That's fine. You know, your palate's just different. Everybody's palate's going to be completely different. So I think that the, the Knob Creek's definitely in a sweet spot. Anywhere between, you know, I think the liquid I've tasted has been seven to 15 years of Knob Creek before, and all of it's fantastic. You know, it just depends on what you want out of it. Uh, like we talked about, too, where you would roll out the barrels and they lived right next to each other in the rickhouse and they taste completely different. So that single barrel program is amazing, not only because you get to come out and go into warehouse D and thieve directly from the barrels. Usually it's about 10 o'clock in the morning, which is the best way to wake up, if you ask me. <laughs> um, it, and you get to experience this all inside of, of warehouse K, which is where we go. I think I just said D, which is totally wrong. But it's in, <laughs> it's in warehouse K. So it's on the back of the property and you're going to travel up there and really just live inside of a rickhouse for a minute and taste bourbon and see, it's just, it, there's nothing like it. There really is nothing like it. So most of these are coming from Warehouse K or they just roll them No, they roll the them to Warehouse okay. K. Yeah, you're doing the tasting in Warehouse K, but they, Knob Creek rests in many different places around the property. So I guess another question when we're talking about all these different bourbons, I mean, is there a, are there, is there a mix that they're taking from certain warehouses that that always have a specific flavor profile? Or are they just saying like, well, we're going to grab these 40 barrels from here and these 40 barrels from here and we're going to mix them until this shit tastes correct, right? Well, we're never going to mix them because you're doing a single barrel program. So okay, well, yeah. that, that, of yeah, course. Yeah, you never want to mix them. So I'm talking about like all the bourbons all in of general. Them. Yeah, so you're mixing for the flavor profile on those. Yeah. But when you're looking at the single barrel program, we're going to pull them from, and there's everybody's got their favorite spots, you know, um, and I haven't been able to pull enough to know exactly where mine would be. But there's certain warehouses that yield either like a mellow proof, but high in flavor or higher in proof and at a younger age or you know, different things that each one of these, these warehouses are going to do. So everybody has kind of their favorites where they pull from. And they have specific areas that I think they like to pull the single barrels from, but it rotates through. So every time you know that you're pulling a single barrel, you're pretty much locking up an entire row until that single barrel is chosen. So And Knob Creek's always 120 proof, right? Somewhere around there, am I right? You're... you're 
100 proof on your rye, 100 proof on your small batch, and then 120 on your single. 120 on the single. Okay. Yep. So when I when I think about it, I need to say, okay, we're going to set aside some barrels that are going to be for the single barrel. Have uh, have they been like, oh man, we just tested this one. This is only 118. We got to we got to roll this one back out. Like, does that ever happen? Um, I haven't seen any that that proofed under that because I don't think that any of them really lose that much proof. We have had them go down to about 121. So you're not adding very, very, very little liquid to that to actually take it down to proof. Mm -hmm. So that's a big change too. You know, if you taste it and it's in the Rick house and you're tasting it at a hundred and say 32 proof, you're going to have to take it down to 120 when it bottles, which is going to take that, that flavor and completely change it. So we do offer water for people and kind of get that idea of exactly how much would be added to it. And you can taste and really see what that liquid would taste like at that level. So what's the idea? Is, is there any possibility to say like, okay, maybe one day we're going to explore the option of actually taking this straight from the barrel, right? We can do a barrel proof version. I mean, uh, at this point, the TTB doesn't necessarily say you have to put a proof on the labels anymore, right? It, it, you can kind of get away with that. The TTB is one of those tricky, tricky areas. Uh, lots of rules and lots of regulations, which is, are, they're needed, right? To make sure that everything stays safe and copacetic. But the 100, I'm sorry, the 25th anniversary that's coming up in June for Knob Creek, you're going to see the single barrel at full proof. Awesome. Yeah. There you go. You heard her here first, folks. Right, there you go. <laughs> Breaking news. And so another thing that was even came out uh, this last year was the Knob Creek 2001 batch. Mm -hmm. So kind of just talk a little bit about that because there's still parts of the country you can still find this stuff on the shelf. And the 2001 is going to be something that comes out a couple of times. So I, we're on our fifth release right now, which I haven't seen the bottles for yet. So you're releasing liquid that is from 2001. So right now we're looking at 16 year old liquid, whereas last year it was 15 year old liquid. So that was just kind of showing you exactly what can happen with that age on our Knob Creek barrels. So there's a couple people that have it around town too. Uh, the, their single barrels are the, what do we call them? The Halloween barrels. Cause they right. went in on October 31st and they're about 15 years old. So it's liquid that's a lot harder to get your hands on. Yeah. So that's, and then it's more aged because it, as we said, fits the profile for some people. It right? does. And I mean, they're, it's delicious liquid. It yeah. really is. Okay, cool. So I think we've, we've touched on Knob Creek a little bit. So I'm going to move over to, um, over to, I guess, another brand staple, right? A brand staple is Booker's in my opinion. Um, Agreed. a very bold barrel proof version that, you know, really captures a, a, a lot of people when they when they want to start venturing into the barrel proof world like it's always like okay start with bookers like that's a, that's an easy one to go into because you're going to realize either you can handle it or you need to you need to you know work your way up to it mm -hmm. it's uncut unfiltered just like the man uh it's it's bigger and bolder than life and it, it's that way so that you can taste it however you want to taste it so really we suggest that you try it neat and then add in your couple drops of water and then add in your ice and really see where it is in that profile that you'd like to sip this bourbon. So it is a little bit more viscous. It leaves a little bit more on your mouth, on your palate. It hugs you from the inside out a little harder and a little longer than the rest of the portfolio, which is amazing in my opinion. So Booker's is just, it's our larger than life bourbon inside of our portfolio. So talk a little bit about the the idea, the inspiration that Booker might have had behind this. Maybe, I don't even know if it was his idea, if oh, it, was it, was. A, it was a tribute sure. to him or something. Yeah. No, this was Booker's tried and true. And so he was the, the grandson of Jim Beam. He was the oldest grandson of Jim Beam. And granddaddy Jim used to have barrels at the house of his favorites that he pulled out of the, the warehouse. And those were his, his bourbons. And Booker saw that and loved that. And when he was a master distiller, felt that that was something that he should do too. And so he had these amazing barrels that he had pulled from the warehouse that were his own Booker's bourbon. And eventually enough people were like, hey man, this is delicious. You really need to do something with this. And that's when he decided, it was the late 80s and then it came out early 90s, to do Booker's bourbon as an actual product. And there's a there's a unique way that, that a... That a I guess you can say this is chosen, right? Because it's not happening a lot of times by a lot of people, the, the sensory scientists behind the scenes, when instead there's also like these round tables that yeah, go on. Yeah, this is the Booker's round table, and I'm still trying to figure out how to get on that panel. <laughs> um, it, it's a group of, of highly either tested people or people that were close to Booker 
um, that taste through this liquid and really decide what the batches are going to be. And so each batch now from 2015 on has been denoted with a name and uh, has that specific sticker on the top so you can actually see the difference in all of your, your Booker's batches. And each one is named for something that has to do with the family. So um, talking about where it came from, he actually used to sit at the Beam Home at his grandmother's kitchen table and that's where he crafted all of the ideas for Booker. So when you see Mama's batch, Mama's batch is in kind of homage to where he was in Mama's kitchen crafting up Booker's. So the idea behind the packaging too, is that Booker's too? Or because it's pretty hard to not spot when you're walking through and you see it in, in, a, in a wooden box with this clear acrylic case all and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Real cool. Okay, so we talked about Booker's. Now, Baker is one that kind of throws me for a loop because in, unless I looked on Wikipedia, I would have no idea, like, why they called it Baker. Uh, who is Baker? Was this a dog? Like, who was this, and, and why is it underneath the Jim Beam portfolio? It's not even a was. Baker is an is. Baker Beam is still with us. He's 80 years young. Um, so he is the son of Carl Beam. Carl was in the distillery working when Jer Beam was our master distiller. So um, in the lineage, everybody's kind of related. And um, so... Says, hence Kentucky, right? Hence, yeah, right. <laughs> Everyone, in the everyone's in possible. the line the is, is uh, completely related. So Booker is in line with... I'm trying to see exactly like lineage-wise. He is around at the same time that Booker's born. Okay, so Booker and Baker are around the same age. And so they grow up in the distillery very close together. But Carl is on the main campus uh, running the distillery. Booker is growing up, you know, so Baker is just kind of growing up on the distillery property. He started when he was 17 doing kind of the grunt work, whatever it was that they needed him to do, doing, you know, the yard work and the landscaping and working his way through and learning everything that he could learn from his father, Carl, who was, he was a stickler. I mean, he was a no-nonsense guy that was very nose to the ground, got business going, got business done, and, and that was what he did day to day. So um, they lived in the Beam home on the top of the hill. I don't know if you've been to the distillery before, that I big have. white house at the yep. top of the hill. That's where Baker and Carl and his family lived um, after T. Jeremiah moved his family here to Louisville. So um, when Booker took over, Baker was kind of his right-hand guy. He was helping run distillery, um, you know, especially in Claremont, because Booker took the Booker No plant, the one in Boston, and really was doing a lot of his stuff down there. Not that he wasn't responsible for Claremont, because he was as well, but Baker was really his right-hand guy in making sure that everything just kept going. So, I mean, nobody knows about him. I love him to death. I'll show you some pictures. I did a photo shoot with him yesterday. Um, he's just a very humble, laid-back guy that doesn't quite know why people want to know about him. And uh, Well, there we go. Now we got it on. It's recorded. It's going to be in <laughs> perpetual in history. We've got some cool programming coming up in, in July to celebrate his 81st birthday. 81st birthday, excuse me. So be on the lookout for that. Real cool. Because at first I was thinking like, oh, he's like the scar to Mufasa, right? Like right. He's, he's, he's the one that's just like, he was like, oh, I wasn't I wasn't the first born, so I'll never get to be Master Distiller. But they kind of threw me a bone or something, right? That's what no, I was thinking at no, first. No, definitely not. So everybody had their hand in the distillery. And if, if a beam wasn't in the distillery, they were usually in another distillery or they married into other families that were bourbon, you know, bourbon families. And so there's a beam in just about every single distillery if you, if you delve deep enough um, in the history somewhere. Um, so it wasn't a, an angry thing or anything like that. It wasn't a throwing of a bone. I think this was this was liquid. The seven-year-old 107 proof liquid is something that, that Baker got to craft. Yeah, so I was about really to say, add. let's talk a little bit about like, you know, of course, uh, the, them caught out the juice inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. I want to talk about like what, make, what, what makes it different or unique compared to Knob Creek or Booker's or anything else in the, the portfolio. So I think it hasn't gotten a lot of love. One, because people don't know who who Baker Beam is. And two, because it, it lays in this weird space in the, the small batch collection. So you've got your Basil Hayden all the way down there, 80 proof. You've got your Booker's, which can be upwards of 130 proof. And then for Knob Creek, you've got the 100 to the 120. So it sits at 107 and it's just kind of overlooked. But it's one of those that's incredibly versatile. It has so much potential, whether you're a scotch drinker trying to make your way into bourbon. It has those earthier notes to help not be as sweet. However, if you add a couple drops of water to it, it sips almost like a cognac. So if you want kind of that that cognac feel, you can sip through that. If you want um, to smoke a cigar with your bourbon, it's fantastic because that 107 proof stands up against the cigar that coats your mouth. So there's just, it's got so many uses. It stands up amazingly well in cocktails and then it sips beautifully neat. 
Awesome. So there's uh, we're, we're we're running through these pretty good right now. So there's <laughs> there's two that almost they kind of have a almost like a tied history. So I want to talk about Basil Hayden and Old Granddad. So kind of talk about um, those two as well. Okay. So they they're not actually part of the family. We did kind of bring them into the family. Basil Hayden had a recipe that we we crafted and took. So you've seen the old granddad that happened, um, you know, in the sixties and seventies. Yeah. That's everybody, everybody that doesn't know, you know, eight, six, two, five, nine, like that's the UPC code for national distillers for all those hunters that are out there. Right. So, uh, you know, when you see that, like everybody kind of knows that that's national distillers, but, uh, beam acquired this, uh, brand or label. Um, I don't know exactly when, but yeah, now it's, now it's under your all's portfolio. Right. And so we have Basil Hayden, which is our 80 proof small batch collection, super delicious, easy sipping bourbon. Um, And then we've got a a little bit more rough around the edges, old granddad. And that comes in your 80 your 100, which is your bonded and then your 114. So if you've ever seen the bust on the old granddad bottles, that's actually Basil Hayden's bust. So that's always kind of something that trips people out. Yeah, they're always kind of like, wait, that, that's him? That's a real guy? That's, that's the thing? Um, so that's just, it's something that we've acquired and then kind of made our own as we've gone through the years. Do you know the, the history be- behind Basil Hayden by any chance? I'm still trying to cultivate exactly what that means. I've focused a lot on, on being family history and not so much about the things that we've acquired along the way. So I don't want to misspeak on that. That's all right. Because there's other there's one more that was a National Stillers brand that you guys take care of right now, and that's Old Crow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so kind of just give us a little bit of, uh, just a tidbit about Old Crow. So Old Crow is, it's one of those calls. Like, it's just what our, I mean, I guess it's more of a well. Um, a lot of the times for people, they see it in, in a well drink. So for the, the bourbon and Cokes of the world, but it's actually really good liquid if you just want to sip it neat. It gets a bad rap because it is something that's always been been mixed, but it's a, a lower proof and easy sip. So what makes these in regards to the portfolio different than like the small batch series, right? Uh, is it the the types of barrels that go in, the mash bill, the um, whatever? Right? It's always going to be new charred oak barrels, always. Um, and so the difference is going to be our yeast strain. So the old granddad and Basil Hayden are going to have their own yeast strain. Okay. And then Jim Beam and the small batch collection are going to have its own yeast strain. Okay. And then your your actual mash bill makeup is going to be always corn forward. And then that secondary grain is always going to be rye, but we consider the Basil Hayden and the old granddad to be a high rye bourbon. So that secondary grain of rye is going to be in a higher amount than it would in our traditional mash bill. And then your third is always going to be the malted barley to, to get all that, the sciencey side going. Right. <laughs> well, sounds good. So I think we're, we've hit on uh, pretty much a lot of the, the, you know, pretty much a lot of the brands itself. Now, one thing that we, we didn't really talk a little bit about was uh, Jim Beam, pioneering a lot of, and kind of paving the way of flavored whiskey, right? I mean, they've got everything from apple, honey, uh, black cherry with their stag, fire, maple. What are your thoughts? Kind of give us your thoughts on those. So I think that your flavors always have a place, right? Whether it be for the people who are, you know, your legal drinking age to about 25, people who don't really like bourbon or whiskey and are trying to get their feet wet and really understand exactly what it's all about. I think that's a great area for them to start in. Um, I also find it amazing for cooking. So if I want to have like a black cherry brownie, I would go ahead and put that red stag in my brownie mix instead of water. You know, or if I want... Some, instead of water. Yeah, yeah there you, you go. So you mix them out. You take the water out and you put the bourbon in instead. Yeah. And so then you've got this black cherry brownie and it's delicious. And then, um, you know, if I'm cooking salmon on the grill, I'll take some of that Jim Beam honey and I'll put it on there and then throw that on the grill. And it's this beautiful glaze that happens at the end of it. Um, or, you know, Jim Beam apple next to a pool with some Sprite and a splash of cranberry is... Is dangerously delicious. <laughs> That's what it sounds. It sounds like a good lake drink, right? It's there an too. amazing lake drink. It really is. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you know we're, we're even kind of just touched a little bit on um, you know back to bartending a little bit. So do you miss bartending at all? You know now you're now you're at Suntory. You're you're. I mean we're sitting here in a fishbowl conference room. Like you're you're <laughs> total corporate now. You're a corporate shill. So like do you miss a little bit about being behind the bar sometimes? Being in here, it's going to look like I'm totally corporate, but honestly, I only do a little bit of office work here, and then I'm out in the world. So I'm doing more bar stuff now than I was as the general manager um, of of a bourbon restaurant, just because I had so many other responsibilities there. But now that we've got SB 11 passed, so I've been actually able to help a lot in allowing, you know, my cocktail background to to push forward and help train people here, come up with cocktails here, um, you know, create 
a whole bunch of different things that maybe we didn't have already in the repertoire. So I've actually got to use my cocktailing a lot more. So no, I don't miss it because I'm doing it. All right. Okay. So talk a little bit more about what Senate Bill 11 really means. Uh, you know, you kind of talk about for you, but just uh, Beam in general, right? In regards of uh, visitor the center as a whole. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Um, so SB 11 really was a, a Senate Bill 11 that passed and allowed distilleries to operate as functioning bars at this point. So most of them are not going to be an open bar that you come into and have as many drinks as you want and leave, but we're able to offer a cocktail with our experience. And we're also able to offer one more sample with our experience. So now when you go to either the American Still House or the Urban Still House here in Louisville, uh, you're going to be able to sip through three different tastes of bourbon and then pick up a cocktail and walk around the distillery grounds and really just adds a whole new aspect to what we're able to do. And we were the first to actually do that, which is fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's what I was actually here for a preview, um, not too long ago and actually got to sample and be able to go through the process of being your own bartender. So kind of, kind of, we'll finish off with that kind of talk about, you know, what's happening here and, and what's the new experience that you guys are offering. So here at the um, Urban Cell House in Louisville on 4th Street, we're able to do our tableside cocktail mixology. So you're going to come in with your groups of people, whoever it is that you want to bring, and, and actually experience sitting down around a table. A mixologist is going to come up and walk you through exactly how to make a cocktail. So everything is going to be laid out in front of you, and it's going to be step-by-step instructions. They're all going to be things that you can find at home or easily make at home so that you're able to replicate this as soon as you go back. And it's a lot of fun. At least I hope you had a lot of fun. I had a I lot did. of fun putting it together. I so. did. It was awesome. You know, I, I actually really liked the um, the whiskey sour that we were actually able to make because my wife, you know, y- you start making whiskey sours and you typically go the the easy route of going and buying sweet and sour mix and bourbon and putting them together. Don't and do then that. And then you realize and you're like kind of like, oh man, I've got <laughs> I've got to like got to bite my cheeks a little bit because it, it's too sweet. However, when you go through and you do it down there, it was choosing fresh jams and uh, egg whites and like all this other kind of stuff. And I was like, oh shit, like, oh, I could, I could get down on doing some of this, right? Yeah. No, whiskey sours, you can definitely get down on, on playing with those a lot. You can infuse them with uh, different flavored cubes was always something fun that I like to do. So uh, mix cranberry juice and water in an ice cube tray and freeze it. And then put that down in your whiskey sour, and as it dilutes, it'll dilute cranberry into your whiskey sour. Oh, man. Um, just, There's a, people are just picking up tips left and right from you right, right now. <laughs> There's a lot of fun things that you can do. I think that you know people pigeonhole themselves with cocktails at home because they feel like it's just unapproachable, and it's really not unapproachable. It just seems that way. So once that's what this is, is it designed for down here at the American Still House is really to I'm sorry, the Urban Still House is is to help you go through and pass that stigma of mixology is too much for me and really kind of take down the walls and show you, no, it's not. You just got to. You just got to have fresh herbs, uh, you know, artisanal jams and all this other kind of stuff. And oh, come on. Everybody <laughs> has that. Just stop at Whole Foods on your way. <laughs> well, Beth, I want to say thank you so much for joining on the show today, kind of giving us a, an overview of yourself and Jim Beam and the brands. This was uh, fantastic just to know the history behind it. And, you know, I didn't even know, I know more, I knew about, you know, Baker Beam in the very beginning, but it was be- definitely better to kind of know a lot of the history and kind of really how he moved up in the ranks and how he was kind of Booker's right-hand man. So this was a really cool experience. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you so for having me. if anybody does want to get in contact with you or they want to find you on Twitter or Facebook, like how, how do they do that? So uh, the handle is Bourbon Bella. So I, I have a Twitter account. I can't get on it because I never use it. And I don't remember the password. I tried to do it like two days ago. But eventually I will be back on Twitter. Um, but on Instagram for sure. And then Beth Burrows on Facebook. Awesome. So thank you again for joining the show. For anybody else that, uh, if you like the, the official podcast of Bourbon, you make sure you support us on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Bourbon Pursuit. You know, follow Beth. Also follow us on all those great social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bourbon Pursuit. If you have any other suggestions, please feel free to send us an email. That's the duo, T-H-E-D-U-O at BourbonPursuit.com. And with that, we will see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers.